This video has been brought to you by Ground News. In our previous installment of diving deep into the ugliest philosophy known to man, Nazism, we learned what constitutes an Aryan. It's more complicated than what you'd think, and I do advise checking out the video after this one, but TLDR, Aryans are ancient advanced humans who lost their civilization mostly because they became soft and quote-unquote bred with inferior races. The closest to pure ancient Aryans can be found in the so-called Nordic races, which mostly also conveniently currently populate Germany. This was then, as we know, used as an ideological excuse for why other nations of this world needed to accept their place in the global hierarchy as lessers and allow for the Ubermensch to repopulate the earth, de facto creating a new Aryan world. But, as most of us should know, during the war and even before it, that theory got a bit wobbly. Cracks started showing with Snooki's forefathers themselves, the Italians. After having gotten into a short verbal dispute with them over who's got the bigger, uh, bigger melanin deficiency, uh, the Nazis agreed that the peoples of Mussolini's Italy were good enough breeding stock for the Nordic peoples of Germany and could therefore cooperate in the creation of the new, new Reich. This extended to some of the French and hell even the Britons as they were quote unquote not as mixed with mongrels and manipulated by Jews as those living pretty much east of Germany. Basically they said okay they're not as perfect as the ideal tall SS blonde blue eyed Nordic archetype but hey. They'll do. They'll do because not fighting a war with the Brits and quietly colonizing the French is a lot more practical than the alternative. This first small hypocrisy was a fledgling indicator of the future developments of the Nazis' views towards what, from the get-go, were supposed to be their inferiors. The beginning of the inherent contradictions to Nazi ideology, or any racist ideology for that matter, that if you keep dividing people based on fictional categories of superiority or inferiority, you'll eventually end up all alone, or dating your cousin, which, funny enough, is exactly how Hitler ended up. But... Okay, these are a bunch of Western white people measuring their inferiority sticks and so on. Where it gets incredibly interesting, though, is how in the Nine Hells the Germans managed to do so much mental gymnastics that they excused away working with what, in their ideological ends, were people closer to gorillas than humans. The Japanese, the Iranians, hell, even something as unholy as the Slavs or Arabs. Even the Nazis and their fervent racism couldn't agree on how certain groups Groups should be treated. So how does anyone expect the people of the 21st century, who are guided by not one but hundreds of different ideologies, to agree about anything? Thankfully, Ground News can help. It's a service that reveals what perspectives different authors and media have when covering the same story, allowing us to have a more holistic understanding of various topics. Take something relevant to the conversation we're having today, critical race theory being taught in American schools. For example, this story of a former English professor suing his school for racial discrimination over being instructed to teach that the English language is racist and embodies white supremacy. The story was covered by the media from many different perspectives, which all present themselves as being quote-unquote objective. Ground News clears this myth up immediately. Simply type any topic or event into Ground News, and you'll have a full list of what sites are reporting on the event, their political leaning according to Ground News, and how factual they are. Right away, you can tell this is disproportionately covered in the media. It gets you to think about why the left is being excluded from the conversation in general. I personally use Ground News to find alternative reports on global events, developing a well-rounded perspective on geopolitical conflicts. Go to ground.news slash Ugopnik. Thank you, Ground News. Now, please, sit down, crack open a can, and join me in finally putting the pieces together on this confusing, hypocritical, anti-Semitic, bigoted, yet weirdly fascinating view Nazis had on so-called honorary Aryans. A story of ideological neck-breaking and fascistic propaganda. How a nonsensical worldview became even more nonsensical. <laughs> An imperial
imperial wannabe led by a power-hungry despot, a sense of national superiority and historic indignation, ready to stop at nothing on their path to achieving unparalleled glory and domination. Germany, uh, I, I mean Japan, the first nation people think of when talking about World War II's strongest axis numero dos, the rising sun, the empire, the butchers of Nanking, and yet, in the eyes of their allies, still mm, subhuman. Germany and Japan became allies due to their shared nationalism, anti-communist fervor, economic interests, desire for imperial expansion, diplomatic isolation, and military cooperation. The alliance was formalized with the signing of a pact in 1940, leading to their participation as the Axis powers in World War II until their defeat in 45. The Nazis held ambiguous views of the Japanese. They regarded the Japanese as non-Aryan, but perceived them as a racially superior superior non-European people. The concept of the yellow race was a stereotype used in Nazi propaganda, but it was different from the vicious hatred directed towards Jews, Slavs, and the Roma. Nazi racial perceptions of the Japanese were discussed much before Hitler came to power, let alone got to the point of building a Looney Tunes level evil ass alliance with them. He talks about them extensively in Mein Kampf, quote, Every manifestation of human culture, every product of art, science, and technical skill, which we see before our eyes today, is almost exclusively the product of the Aryan creative power. The foundations of actual life in Japan today are not those of the native Japanese culture, but the real foundations of contemporary Japanese life are the enormous scientific and technical advancements of Europe and America, that is to say, of Aryan peoples. Only by adopting these achievements as the foundations of their own progress can the various nations of the Orient take a place in contemporary world progress, if from today onwards the Aryan influence on Japan would cease, and if we suppose that Europe and America would collapse, then the present progress of Japan in science and technique might still last for a short duration, but within a few decades the inspiration would dry up, and native Japanese character would triumph, while the present civilization would become fossilized and fall back into the sleep from which it was aroused about 70 years ago by the impact of Aryan culture. TLDR, the Japanese, while currently a great and pure race, are non-Aryan and as such should be grateful to their superiors, without whom they would have a very little advancement to speak of. This weird, unwritten historical opinion about some kind of equal relationship between the Nazis and the Japanese, which everyone brings up during drunken historic debates in the pub, is a hilarious myth. It's pretty simple. In the idiotic Nazi ideological perspective, the Japanese were in essence inferior but still not as corrupted by the Jews or communists to become unsalvageable. That, combined with typical white boy orientalist obsession, like Himmler wanting the SS to be like the samurai, makes for a perfect potential ally. While most academics argue that the Japanese pact was one born exclusively out of geopolitical convenience, I believe it can be easily argued that the ideological ground was conveniently set there to an extent as well. The Japanese already garnered some respect among the higher echelons of Nazi society even before World War II was looming. Conveniently enough, they were also far away enough to not be perceived as a threat to the purity of the Nordic race. While inferior, they were still a powerful nation in the eyes of ideologues who respected nothing but power and as such could be considered a worthy ally. An ally which will one day likely have to be completely eradicated, but an ally which can easily be sold both to the heavily indoctrinated members of the Nazi party as well as to the wider German populace. Ironically, the Japanese were a perfect partner to the German fascist exactly because they were so different. The Nazis' superiority over people who looked a lot more like them, like the Jew or the Slav, required action, victory, domination as proof of superiority. The Japanese, just simply based on racial aesthetics and a strange Eastern culture, were someone that the Germans were already so different to that it was never a question of whether the German eagle could defeat the Japanese panda. The question was only when.
the Japanese panda was to be tolerated by the eagle, the Slavic allies of World War II Germany were seen as nothing but dogs. Mutts that will serve the purpose of sniffing out their blood brothers and mutts who would be disposed of immediately after the war. The heritage of Slavs who bent the knee and believed the lies their German overlords sold to them was so strong that it still lives on today. There are hundreds of different neo-Nazi organizations all across southern and eastern Europe. Some of them conveniently ignore what their ideological daddy thought about them and fool themselves into thinking that there's anything even remotely Aryan about the Slav, while others have built their own specific fascist school of thought, which differs to Nazism and has risen to an almost cult-like status, like for example Azov in Ukraine or Russish to a lesser extent in Russia. But okay, what exactly was the Nazi German attitude towards some Slavic nations at the beginning of the war, towards the end, and most importantly, how did they see the groups which chose to fight on their side? Understanding that Nazi racial ideology, due to its inherently insane and unscientific nature, has always been rather fluid, the only way we can really learn about the general Nazi attitudes towards particular groups of people is through the shit they wrote, said, and posted on that era's version of Reddit, Nazi Party newspapers. At first, I was going to bombard you with around a thousand words worth of insane level 100 racist quotes by Nazis talking about all these different individual Slavic ethnicities, but I decided to spare your beautiful, sensitive souls, and instead I opted for a truly 21st century solution. I'll run all this racist shit through an AI, and it'll rephrase all those hundreds of quotes into individual ones. So let's get the racism started with the chart-topping Slav of 2023, the Ukrainians. Ukrainians are Slavs, an inferior race that must be subjugated and assimilated into the German race. We shall use them as laborers in our empire and exterminate those who resist. Or let's look at the Poles. The Poles are subhuman creatures, a racially impure mix of Slavic and Germanic blood. They are enemies of the German people and must be eradicated to make way for our superior race. Or what about Russians? The Russians are subhuman creatures, a racially impure mix of Slavic and Asian blood. They are enemies of the German people and must be exterminated to make way for our superior race. And what about Serbs? The Serbs are fit only for slave labor and exploitation. They lack any individuality or capacity for self-governance. A bit more original there, as we can see. Or, arguably, the Germans' least hated Slavs, the Croats. The Croats are racially impure, a mixture of Slavic and Mediterranean blood. They are useful to the Germanic expansion in the East as long as they serve our interests. However, they are not to be trusted and must be kept under strict control. German consistency with their racial attitudes towards Slavic groups was undeniable, but as they say a real politic is real politic. Just make a deal now, shred it later if you want. The Nazis would just invent stories to explain why certain people were not a problem, even though up until yesterday these ethnicities were apparently jumping out of Jewish made toilets and eating German children. For for example, when it comes to the Bulgarians and the Croats who were accepted into honorary Aryanhood, the usual excuse given was that they were non-Slavs, which were Slavicized and as such could be reintroduced to their older and superior ways and integrated into the Germanic whole. Historical proof varies on whether the Germans plan to apply these promises post-war, but Fascism 101 implies that no way they would. Without a foreign enemy to fight, a fascist, in this case a Nazi, uh, can't really operate or garner support. So which would be the first nations uh, worth going after once the so-called Jewish and communist problem was solved? Well, of course, the no longer useful Slavic hordes. So, my little anti-racist in training. Hitler's attitudes towards honorary Aryanhood given to Slavs, in contrast to the one given to the Japanese, was one of even purer, simpler geopolitical interest. A total and hypocritical abandonment of Nazi principles and a very interesting insight into their inability to turn racism into a coherent or practical worldview. And that's exactly where the greatest weakness as well as the greatest strength of fascist ideologies lies. On the one hand, it's easy to twist the fictitious bigoted version of the world you have as a movement to better suit your current needs, while on the other it allows people who have even the most basic modicum of critical thinking to see that the ideology at the end of the day stands for nothing, not even the bigotry it preaches. No idea what's worse though, a, a racist or, or an unprincipled racist. <laughs> The 
Nazi party line on religion was always more intentionally vague than it was critical, a strategic approach intended not to stir too much trouble with domestic religious supporters or potential foreign allies. The long-term goal, though, once the Third Reich was established, was to replace traditional religion with the worship of the state's race, wider leadership, and most importantly, the Führer. When it comes to the Nazis' relationship to Muslims, the mingling between different players in the Arab world and the Führer's snakes was complex and encompassed various elements, including contempt, propaganda, collaboration, and emulation. In public and private, Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler made statements praising Islam and its political ideology, considering it the more disciplined and practical version of Christianity. However, Hitler expressed strong racial disdain for Arabs and North Africans. The Grand Mufti on Jerusalem, a Amin al-Husseini was one of the most prominent Arab figures collaborating with the Nazi. He actively supported their cause and was granted honorary Aryan status by the Nazis. Al-Husseini played a role in planning anti-Jewish operations and recruited Muslim soldiers for the German SS units. In North Africa and the Middle East, despite Nazi racial theory degrading Arabs as racially inferior, individual Arabs who supported the Third Reich were treated with so-called respect, probably only temporary respect. The Nazis cooperated with Arab nationalist leaders during actions like the Arab Revolt in Palestine or the Anglo-Iraqi War. In North Africa, the Wanese Conference in 1942 included plans for the elimination of Jews in territories under Nazi control, which included Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. The SS established special units to kill Jews in North Africa, and over 2,500 Tunisian Jews died in labor camps. As you can see with the Arabs, the pattern continues. The temporary lift of racist attitudes towards a potential ally, which in this case could help Germany's imperial aspirations while hurting equally atrocious Western colonial efforts in the wider Arab world. Like the racist uncle who has one black friend and constantly calls him one of the good ones, the Nazis used any misinformed or manipulated Arab ally as a tool for their own ends. Where it gets much more interesting and hella wilder though is Nazi Germany's relationship with Iran. In 1939, Nazi Germany sent over 7,500 books with racial tones advocating for greater collaboration between Aryan Persians and Germans. In 1936, Iranians were classified as quote, pure blood Aryans and thus were excluded from the Nuremberg Law. Iranian railways were constructed by German engineers. Railway companies were specifically ordered to avoid employing any person of Jewish descent in any of its subdivisions. Hitler personally promised that if he defeated the Soviet Union, he would return all of the Persian land taken by Russians during the 19th and 20th century. Many Gentile anti-Semites were preparing for what was called the massacre of the Jews and were warning Jews in the streets to leave Iran while they still can. Nazi Germany had nightly broadcast in Persian and was calling many leading Iranian politicians who had anti-German tendencies crypto-Jews. In order to fight the growing racial anti-Semitism among the Iranian population, many Jews joined the Tudeh party and advocated for communism. From 1939 to 41, Iran's top foreign partner, nearly 50% of its total trade, was Germany, which helped Iran in opening modern sea and air communications with the rest of the world. As the war progressed, the Shah was aggressively pressured, though, by the Allies to step down, and Iran's ideological alliance with Germany was ground to a stop. But still, the Iranians, it seems, were the only significantly large non-Germanic or European nation which the Nazis actually and unironically considered to be a part of their own wider demented racial family. While the geopolitical interests were obvious, I mean, a strong ally who owes you a lot working on your behalf in one of the most oil-rich territories in the world is an incredibly valuable asset to have, it still seems that the Nazis did not hold ill feelings towards the Iranians ideologically. One of us, okay? That's one of us. Gobble, gobble, yeah, one of us. We <laughs> accept that one of us. Gobble, gobble, one of us. During the Nazi regime in Germany, there were instances where individuals of even Jewish descent were granted exemptions from anti-Semitic policies and classified as honorary Aryans. These exemptions were often rare exceptions and were mainly granted to individuals who had made significant contributions to the German nation, culture, or economy, or were considered valuable to the interests of the Nazi state. Uh, here are a few historic examples of individuals classified as honorary Aryans 
during the Nazi era. I will probably mispronounce their names, but I don't care. Emil Maurice was one of Adolf Hitler's earliest associates and a founding member of the Nazi party. He was of Jewish descent through his maternal grandmother, but due to his personal loyalty to Hitler, Hitler intervened and granted him an exemption from the anti-Jewish Nuremberg laws. Hitler valued Maurice's loyalty and personal relationship, and he served as Hitler's personal chauffeur and bodyguard. Or Warner von Braun. Warner von Braun was a prominent German German engineer and rocket scientist known for his contributions to the development of the V-2 rocket during World War II. Despite his family's partial Jewish ancestry, he was classified as an honorary Aryan and allowed to continue his work on the German rocket program. After the war, von Braun went to work for the United States space program. Talk about betraying one guy for another guy for another guy for another guy. Or moving on to Hertha Brothe, who was a female concentration camp guard who worked at several camps, including Bergen-Belsen. She was classified as an honorary Aryan despite being of partial Jewish descent. Brothe was known for her cruelty towards prisoners and was later convicted for war crimes. These exceptional cases occurred for pragmatic and strategic reasons, highlighting the complexity of the Nazi regime's policies and the manipulation of propaganda. The incredibly rare special treatment of certain Jewish individuals in the Third Reich was like a microcosmic allegory for their treatment of whole states, which we talked about previously. The reasons a Jew could get the status of honorary Aryan were the following. Pragmatic consideration, like with the Arabs, personal connections, like with the Iranians, propaganda at image, like with the Japanese, and labor utilization, like with the Slavs. There is something profoundly pathetic in an ideology rooted so deeply in anti-Semitism, being led by a man who could call for the murder of millions who he's never met on a whim, while not having the stomach to do the very same thing to an individual who he happens to know. Nazism, with its focus on Nordic Aryan superiority and the persecution of Jews and other inferior races, was undeniably one of the darkest and ugliest so-called philosophies known to our goofy-ass species. As the Nazis sought to create a new Aryan world, they faced contradictions within their own ideology. The use of the so-called honorary Aryan as a propaganda tool shows us that the Nazis and all fascists in general are not only idiotically backwards, unscientific and smooth-brained, but also hypocritical critical, sleazy, unprincipled, and all-round pathetic. As they say, ask 10 Nazis what they believe in and they'll tell you 10 different things. This is a weakness we should never let them turn into a strength, allowing them to crawl their way into our institutions, communities, and governments. By being vigilant of fear-mongering, ethnic and cultural divisiveness, obsession with hierarchy, and most importantly, camouflaged bigotry, we will know that even when they tell you you're one of their own today, while dragging away your neighbor, Tomorrow, it'll be you on the chopping block. They can keep their honor and their Aryanhood. Thank you for watching. Now, be a good Tavarish and smash that subscribe button if you liked what you saw. Or, even better, if you are able to, check out my Patreon, where, for the price of less than a can of beer a month, you can help this channel run. Now, I'd like to take a moment to thank all my wonderful patrons, without whom none of this would be possible. Especially